So far in 2024, I have read seven books. Those books are Shatter Me by Tahira Marthy, The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis, Unfollowed by Megan Phelps Roper, The Reluctant Queen by Elaine Snuggs, Till We Have Faces by C.S. Lewis, Everything Sad is Untrue by Daniel Nairi, and Fellowship of the Ring, The First Lord of the Rings book by J.R.R. Tolkien. In amongst this set of books, I actually have a new favorite, and that book is Everything Sad is Untrue by Daniel Neary. Now March is fast approaching and I thought it was a good time to just pause and to just take you through the books I've read so far this year. My reading target for 2024 is 52 books, that being if you do the maths one book a week. This is a realistic, reasonable target for me. I didn't want to be a part of this booktube hustle culture that I got caught up in last year. I just want to enjoy reading and so far one book a week is a really healthy, manageable number. So I'm just going to give you little reviews of all the books I've read. You know that I love talking about books and if I've got a good recommendation, you bet I'm going to share it with you. I also feel really privileged when you take my recommendations on board and actually go and read the book. And as an aspiring writer, I also think it's important to praise books that we like because that writer has put so much time and effort into that book and I want to support that work, which is what I'm gonna do with Daniel Neary, which we'll get onto a bit later. So the first two books of the year that I read were Shatter Me by Zahira Murphy and The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis. Shatter Me, I gave three stars and The Great Divorce, I gave five, five out of five, a million out of five stars um, but I'm actually not gonna go into those in detail in this video the reason being I have a whole separate reading vlog with in-depth reviews and I don't want to sound like a broken record so I'm not going to go into it again at the risk that some of you have seen that video and are like why is she going on about it again um, but this one don't get me started on it because I will go on about it. The next book I read this year is a book called Unfollow by Megan Phelps Roper. This is a memoir slash autobiography, therefore I didn't give it a rating, um, but I will just share my little review with you. So I am really glad that I read this book. Um, it's insightful heartbreak. Oh, before I get into my review, I actually should probably tell you what it's about. This is my New Year's resolution. It's when I'm giving book reviews to actually give you an idea of what the content of a book is rather than just my opinions. Okay, Megan Phelps Roper grew up in the Westboro Baptist Church. Um, I really don't know how to describe Westboro Baptist Church, so I'm not going to try, but just Google them. Um, anyway, as a 20-something year old, she became convicted that Westboro's teachings actually weren't biblical and she left the church. Um, and this is her journey of coming to that realization and then her journey being out of the church. It was obviously so insightful because she spoke up as someone who had been on the inside. Um, it was really heartbreaking in places for reasons I'll get onto. And what was so remarkable about this autobiography is that it's written with such love, grace and respect. And what I mean by that is a lot of autobiographies written by individuals who might have had a more difficult upbringing, childhood, there's like potentially un understandably a lot of anger there still but with Megan Phelps Roper she in this book she puts that to one side and you just really get the impression that she still loves her mum she still loves her family and I just found that quite admirable and I found that a very Christian attitude to be honest so that was something that I noted um but as a Christian reading this book it was incredibly sad for two main reasons the first reason being the, as I perceive, twisting and misunderstanding of scripture um, in Westboro Baptist Church, like as a Christian reading that. And secondly, the fact that at the end of the book, you know, it's not like Megan leaves this, what's been described as a cult and encounters the gospel. She doesn't. And that is just always going to be sad in an autobiography. Like I, as a Christian, want everyone to know Jesus. But also she went through so much growing up that was associated with Christianity, that it is understandable, um, but obviously really sad. So yeah, I am really grateful to Megan for this book. Um, and also she has a podcast that she hosts called The Witch Trials of JK Rowling, which a boy in my church recommended Luke. Luke came on the podcast and I listened to all of those episodes and found it so interesting. It's talking about the um, transgender conversation 
um, in relation to JK Rowling and comments she made. And as a Christian listener, I really, really found it interesting. So I would definitely recommend that podcast. Next up, we've got The Reluctant Queen by Elaine Snuggs. I'm just getting my review up for this because it's history. Therefore, I can't fluff what I'm going to say. This was the book club book for my church for like January, December. And I actually gave this book 4.5 stars. It was absolutely fascinating. Definitely recommend. Um, to give you a bit of a synopsis, because that is my New Year's resolution and we're on a roll so far. Um, the Reluctant Queen tells the story of four Reformation women. We've got Anne Askew, whose Protestant writings inspired faith throughout the country of Great Britain and who was tortured for the sake... Is it Great Britain or the UK? Anyway, she was tortured for the sake of the gospel, yet never surrendered the names of fellow Protestants, thereby saving their lives. Actually, a common theme in a couple of books I've read, that is, which is so amazing. Secondly, Catherine, and heartbreaking. Secondly, Catherine Parr, who saw her ascent to queen, much like Esther's in the Bible, that God had appointed her for a time like this. Thirdly, Lady Jane Grey, who was only a teenager when she became queen, a decision largely out of her control. Yet her life was one of sincere Protestant faith and wisdom beyond her years given by God. And lastly, Catherine Willoughby, who refused to forsake her faith for Catholic doctrine, so much so that she was actually exiled for the sake of the gospel. So out of all these women, the one that touched me the most, the story that touched me the most was that of Lady Jane Grey. She, like I said, she was just a teenager and I obviously have heard of her, but I didn't even know she had a faith. Um, she's also known as the Nine Days Queen. She was actually sentenced to death and yet days before her execution, boldly debated a prominent Catholic and she was a teenager. Um, she didn't back down. She boldly proclaimed the truth of scripture, confessed to God that she should never have accepted the crown given to her in an attempt to keep the Catholic Bloody Mary off the throne and then trusted she would be saved by grace through faith alone. That was something so remarkable to me that she still confessed what she like perceived as her wrongdoing to God and how that speaks into the life of every Christian and how we need to confess our sin to God. Um, in order to understand who Jesus is, we must understand that we are sinners too. Lady Jane Grey then spent her last days encouraging others to trust in Christ for salvation and not the religious rituals and practices of the Catholic Church. In an extremely moving description, she mirrored Jesus' words during her execution, proclaiming that into the hands of God she committed her spirit, which is the words that Jesus said on the cross. This book taught me so much about the Reformation, which... I'm not going to go into but google it um and well i kind of have gone into it and also the key figures in that boldly stood on the gospel and against the catholic doctrine that was kind of the norm prior to the reformation um yeah it was also interesting seeing henry the eighth's role despite being motivated by his want of a divorce in actually advancing the reformation i was deeply struck by the level of persecution protestants faced while catholic monarchs won the throne and the lack of persecution when a protestant ruled that was very striking. Um, inspiring descriptions of Christians who boldly stood on the truth of scripture and refused to conform to non-scriptural doctrines. The reason I didn't give this book a full five stars was because I found the writing a little hard to follow in places. Like just a lot of lists of people and places and I was just like, whoa, I can't keep up. But the other ladies in the book were boys who said that they struggled with that too. So that made me feel better. Um, but I completely recommend this book. It was a really, really good read. Speaking of good reads, yes, I am reading this review off Goodreads. I always say this on my book videos, but I will link my Goodreads account down below. Please add me. I love having you all on Goodreads and chatting about books and seeing and sharing recommendations. Next up, we've got Till We Have Faces by C.S. Lewis. Not going to go into too much detail because like I've said already for a couple of others, I have a separate video on this book because I loved it so much. I'm talking 20 minutes of me going in depth with quotes, my review, my thoughts and stuff. But basically in a nutshell, this book is C.S. Lewis's retelling in the form of a novel of the myth of Cupid and Psyche, which is Greek mythology. And on the surface, I was like, Greek mythology, what on earth? I thought he was a Christian writer. Well, let me tell you, there is a much deeper, profound Christian message in this book, making it one of the favorites of his. And also I think one of the most underrated because I've never heard of it before one of you guys actually recommended it on this YouTube channel in my comment section. So, oh my goodness, this only fueled my love of C.S. Lewis. So yeah five stars okay i'm so excited 
This is honestly one of the main reasons I decided to film this video. Next up, Everything Sad is Untrue by Daniel Neary. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, new favourite book alert. I want to say thank you to two people, James and also Tim, who is the pastor of our church, who recommended this book because it is honestly up there with my other favorite books of all time. We're talking Anything by C.S. Lewis, um, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. That's, it's probably on a level with that, honestly. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of a, a review of it, and then you can decide if you wanna read it. Hint, hint, you absolutely should go and read it. So this is what I put on my Goodreads. I put, everyone read this book. Go now, before you read this review, I'm waiting. So that's my, my um, what I'm saying to all of you now. You can watch this video or you can go and order it right now. Um, anyway, in all seriousness, Daniel Neary, who's the author, this is an autobiography, he grew up in Iran. And then his mum, who was a devout Muslim, became a Christian and in doing so became a target. Um, meaning that Daniel's family had to leave Iran else they would die um, because there was there was pressure being put on his mum to give the names of the other people in his mum's like secret Christian church in Iran. So they actually made it out of Iran, but it was honestly a miracle or a series of miracles as Daniel describes it. And I was just like, wow, the power of God is incredible. And I love books that remind me of that. So we learn of Daniel's life as a refugee and then as an immigrant in Oklahoma. This book moved me to tears in several places for many reasons, including the goodness of God. Um, I feel deeply privileged to have been given an insight into Naomi's life, as I do with many autobiographies. We're studying autobiographical writing on my master's at the moment. And I wrote that the other day, just how much of a privilege it is to share in someone's experience. Um, but I also feel deeply troubled at what he's experienced in his life. Um, but Nayari's writing still conveys the magnitude of God's love that he and his family clung to throughout. And that is what has made this book one of my new time favorites. It's just, oh, it's just the worldview of another Christian. It's just how he's, you know, vulnerable enough and brave enough to share his story with us, but also proclaim the goodness of God. Oh my goodness, amazing. So yeah, he tells us the story from the perspective of his younger self, just one of the reasons why I love this book. It's such a unique, creative and beautiful book for many reasons, including his vocabulary choices, his use of structure being this book doesn't have chapters. It has new sections every few pages or so. Um, and it also flashes between the past and present, which meant it was just a unique read in terms of all those elements, as well as the story just being deeply profound. Um, so yeah, this is eye opening and it's a stark insight into the reality of life as a religious minority then as a refugee and as an immigrant um, but his tone as I've mentioned throughout is one of hope as he chooses to see the good in life which is remarkable and a challenge to us all and it's why Christian autobiographies never fail to blow my mind because oh my goodness just the stuff that Daniel Neri has been through and yet and yet and yet the goodness of God, and he proclaims that on these pages. And oh, maybe I should make a separate video because there's so many quotes. I'm not gonna make a separate video, but I will just read you one quote. Reading is the act of listening and speaking at the same time with someone you've never met but love. Even if you hate them, it's a loving thing to do. You speak someone else's words to yourself and hear them for the first time. What you're doing now is listening to me in the parlor of your mind, but also speaking to yourself, thinking about the parts of me you like or the parts that aren't funny enough. You evaluate, like Mrs. Miller says, who's his teacher, who that's kind of the premise of the book is that he's in class in Oklahoma telling these stories about his past, which he's telling to us through the book. Like Mrs. Miller says, you think and wrestle with every word. And I love that because it's so true. So five stars and something so cool is that I sent Daniel, I'm talking like with friends. I sent him an email just saying all the stuff I basically just said to you and he replied and it was so nice because he said about how a bookshop in Bath had contacted him because he's obviously based um in the US he said it's kind of hard to know how a book's doing internationally but a bookshop in Bath had actually contacted him and he said and now I know I've got a friend in Cheshire meaning me which is so I was like, yes, you have. And I'm, I said to him, I said, I'm going to talk about this book on my YouTube channel. So 
there you go I have done finally the book that I finished like a few hours ago <laughs> The Fellowship of the Ring by J.R.R. Tolkien the first Lord of the Rings book I was gonna do a reading vlog of me reading the whole trilogy that plan quickly crumbled when I realized that this book was not going to be a quick read firstly Someone at church said to me, Lydia, you're a creative writing master's student and you've never read Lord of the Rings. And that was it for me. I was like, you're right. I need to read Lord of the Rings. It feels good that I can finally have an opinion on it. Um, and I am very, very grateful to everyone who recommended I read this, many of whom are very dear friends, which is why I want to be extra like cautious in how I articulate my review in conveying that I am so grateful to all the friends that recommended I read this because I am so glad that I have read it. But I'm gonna give you my honest thoughts and opinions right now in the form of a list. Here's what I liked about the first Lord of the Rings book. Tolkien's writing, meaning his vocabulary choices, just the way he uses words. I don't think it can be argued that it's quite remarkable and quite exquisite. Secondly, how I felt as a Christian reader. There was nothing in here that made me want to shut the book. There was nothing in here that made me convicted. I felt very much at peace. Thirdly, the world building, need I say more? That's another thing that is so remarkable. It's just the history of Middle Earth, um, the different characters created, and all of that, I get it now. I get it that Lord of the Rings very much pioneered the fantasy genre, and just the extensive history, like even the prologue in this book, was so extensive. He's created a whole new world in so much depth. It was just quite remarkable. And fourthly, the, you'll know if you've read this, the actual concept of the ring, from the moment I read about how Bilbo acquired the ring from Gollum, I was very hooked on like the lore surrounding it. I find it very exciting. However, and I say this tentatively because I know the Lord of the Rings fandom is huge and also that many of my very close friends whose book recommendations I absolutely do trust are in that category. I say this so tentatively. I can acknowledge that this book was brilliant, but it doesn't mean I enjoyed it. I hope that's okay. I really hope that's okay. I'm so scared to say this. And I'm going to explain why. There's two reasons. The first reason, the pacing. It felt very slow. To summarise, this is my Goodreads review, to summarise, lots of walking, lots of talking, lots of trees, lots of jump scares and not much action in my opinion, which leads me on to the second reason, which is the density. So I often found it difficult to keep reading, but honestly what saved this book for me was the audiobook. So yeah, I think the audiobook kind of saved it for me, um, but I think it's because of the number of characters, the amount of speech and the world building, but maybe that will get easier with the second book because it's the case with most fantasy series. The first book's always going to be a bit more difficult as you're like adjusting to the world. Um, but ironically, all the reasons I didn't necessarily, well, all the reasons that made it good also were a couple of the reasons that made me as a person struggle with the book. And it took me over a month to read, which I can't remember the last time a book took me that long to read. Um, but I am going to read book two, all that being said, because I've been told that book two is more action packed. Um, and I'm so glad I've read it. I'm so glad I have read it. I, I am so glad that I've read it. And I'm going to watch all the films. But yeah, honest opinion, don't kill me. Love you so much. Thank you for being here. And I'll see you soon. Goodbye and God bless.